Hey, everybody. It's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. How are you? Welcome to a rather warm July Wednesday afternoon. Uh, you are with us because I think you're ready to hear about part two of the conversation we've been having around uh, equity and communications and social justice. And so we're going to get to that in one quick minute. As we're entering the room, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you've been with us before, we've got a pretty full room here. Hopefully you know this uh, from, from past uh, sessions. Go ahead, if you would, hop into the chat box. Chances are it's already set the little blue band down there at the bottom is already set to all panels and attendees or everyone. If you would just type in, we've been doing this a little idea we borrowed from Professor Brene Brown down in Houston. If you would type in your name, where you're coming in from, and then her idea that the Brene Brown idea of a two word check in. So just two words describe how you're feeling just now. And so if you'll go ahead, I'll try to type one in myself here. Hi, it's Sean and I'm uh, warm and ready for this well, the pandemic to end if i can type <laughs> and i see some other people in here hey suzanne how are you a-okay trishna how are you elisa nicole kathleen happy birthday kathleen that's awesome it's your birthday lisa maureen zach how are you out in denver uh avis if i'm pronouncing that properly ruth tanya how are you rebecca Emily from the Bay Area, Lisa, how are you? Danielle, Rebecca, how are you, my friend out in Denver? I'm wishing I had your weather, I think. Uh, all right, well, so as y'all are continuing to do this and more of you are coming in, Ellen, Bill, uh, Bobby, Mara, Phil, Paula, Kristen, y'all can follow along. Uh, say hello to each other as well, if you would. I'm just gonna give you a couple quick updates as the room continues to fill up, and then I'm gonna pass it on to, to Manal, Sabine, and Sarah. So uh, Mr. T, Tristan Mahabir, our partner in crime here at Network HQ, which is now far flung, right, uh, is running the slide deck. Our colleague Kareem is taking notes, and so Kareem will have some notes for us all in a Google Doc. He is also gonna be tossing uh, links into the chat if and as we need them over the course of this hour. And of course, y'all are welcome to do that as well. We are also, as we always do, uh, keeping an eye on things on Twitter. We're making notes there. Our colleague, Yab Sarah Ferris, will be making notes on Twitter. Uh, if you keep two browsers open, you want to check out Twitter. The hashtag we're using there is ComNetLive, C-O-M-N-E-T-L-I-V-E. -E. Okay, so with that, hey, everybody, Grace, Barbara, Neha, who else? Amy, Aaron, lots of y'all here with us. Tasha, how are you? Uh, let's go ahead, Mr. T, let me tell you a couple quick things if you'll advance the side. Local groups, so maybe you all know about this. I hope you certainly do. They're gathering virtually because, well, because, right? Uh, but coming up in the next week, uh, our friends in Detroit, uh, the local group in New York, and the local group in Boston will all be gathering. If you want more information about that, uh, chances are, Kareem's already done it. There's a link there in the, uh, in the chat, so you can avail yourselves of that. There's, I think, 17 groups around the country now, so they're all gathering virtually. We had a great session just last week with uh, the, the folks up in Seattle with Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who helped write the dream speech with Martin Luther King. So lots on offer there. Please take advantage. All right, Mr. T, if you'll take us ahead. Uh, Y'all know about this, and we're all going to send you an email about this in a few minutes, but uh, we are planning for our first ever virtual event. Uh, may still feel like it's light years away because it's in September, but not to us because it's less than 60 days now, believe it or not. Uh, but we are going to be gathering some really extraordinary folks, and we'll tell you more about that through email. I won't waste your time. If you're interested, maybe uh, Kareem, again, he's already beat me to this. If you want more information, comnetworkvirtual.org, and it's there in the chat. All right, Mr. T. Brene Brown is awesome, Jamala. That's right. Uh, and for those of you who want to do this, and maybe actually the thing I should be asking for is your help. We have some awesome scholarships available, 50 of them, for people who work in the nonprofit sector, right, or the nonprofit field, so not foundations. If you are an academic or if you're a graduate student, the Rockefeller Foundation has given us the funds to make 50 seats available at V+. And that is the kind of event that we're having, sort of an expanded or extended event that's really focused on building community, building relationships, um, and we'll do some special learning sessions as well. That's actually going to happen before, during, and after the V event that we're holding in late September. And so if you'd like to take part in that or you know somebody who might but maybe doesn't have the resources to do so just now because things are a little odd, uh, you please go ahead and encourage them to check out the Corel scholarships. And I'm pretty sure, and he did, Kareem put it in the link for you all. So if you don't have to use it, that's great. But we could certainly use, if you wouldn't mind sharing that on the Zuckerberg uh, platform that will not be named or LinkedIn or any number of other things, or even just sharing it with your colleagues in the office, we would certainly be grateful. So thanks for that. I will stop yakking now because this is not what y'all came here for. And I'm going to pass it off to my friend Manal, who's smiling because she knows uh, it's always fun to hear me shut up. It's hard to do, but I'm going to do it now. Manal's going to take over the screen, which is why you're seeing black. And why don't y'all take it away and I'll see y'all on the other side for questions.
Thank you, Sean. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our roundtable on systemic racism, white supremacy, culture, and sustaining momentum. Uh, Reveni and Witt was really um, flattered to be invited to come back and speak with you all again. And this time, we are really honored to be able to have our guest, Sarah Boysen, present with us. And so I want to start by allowing Sarah to introduce herself to you all. Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Boysen. I am the principal of digital communications at Communities and Schools. Um, we're based out of Arlington, Virginia, but we also um, have affiliates across the country in 25 states and the District of Columbia. Very excited to be here. Thanks, Sarah. Sabina, do you want to introduce yourself again? Yes. Um, hi. For those who haven't met me uh, at our um, uh, first roundtable with uh, ComNet, uh, my name is Sabina Marks. Uh, I'm a social scientist by training. Uh, I'm a communication strategist with Brevity and Wit, working with Minnell. And for the last um, 20 years, roughly, I've been working on communications for social and environmental change. And I've been doing so by drawing on social science insights, in particular those from the behavioral sciences, and applying those to um, communicating the impact of climate change on public health, on disaster preparedness and response, and other environmental and social issues. Thank you, Sabina. Um, and so for those of you who don't know already, my name is Minal Bopaya, and I am the founder and principal consultant at Brevity and Wit. Um, I'm the only Minnal Bopai on the internet, as I said last time, so you can look me up and find out all the stuff that we do and um, all of those good things. I do want to take a moment actually to give a shout out uh, to blackillustrations.com, which is where I got this graphic. It's a wonderful website that offers um, like image packets um, that feature black figures in office settings and healthcare settings. Some of them have been free and some of them have been for really reasonable rates. They'll, he'll provide it to you as JPEGs, PNGs, and all sorts of files. So um, I say that because there is no longer a reason for people not to be able to feature black people in their illustrations. So I invite you all to look that up and um, let's get started. So Today's agenda, we're going to talk about what systemic racism is, um, white supremacy culture, and then how to sustain momentum um, in the sort of environment and world that we're living in um, with all of the stresses that we have and all of the pulls on our attention. And then we're going to um, try to have a more extended Q&A this set time so that you all can ask your questions. A couple of ground rules, which we like to always do before we start. Um, we don't have a good language in this country yet around talking about racism and differences. So this might be uncomfortable at some points. Um, it's okay to use this today as a learning opportunity and ask questions. The only real ground rule around that is to not use dehumanizing language. And I think whenever possible to also speak for yourself and from your experience, not for other people or other groups. And finally, no one is a diversity expert. I'm a big believer that humanity is too diverse for anybody to know all about all of it. Um, so feel free to chime in either via the chat or the Q&A about insights that you might have as well. And with that, I want to hand it off to Sarah, who's going to get us started. All right. Thanks, Manel. Mm -hmm. So um, right before I get started, I just want to share really quickly that it's important to note that I am only one Black woman, so I can only speak to the lived experiences that I've been through or that I've seen through my own eyes or through um, the perspectives of the people in my life. Um, I'm not here to be a representative for all Black people or for all Black women. Um, and I also just want to preference that systemic racism impacts individual persons of color um, differently. Uh, and there can be some similarities, but how that individual person experiences it can often be very different and multifaceted. All right, so in terms of the, the, the actual word systemic racism, I wanted to break down the term so that we could better understand it. So looking at the first word systemic, it refers to something that is spread throughout, um, something that affects a group or system 
such as a body, an economy, market, or society as a whole. And racism itself is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of um, their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is minority or marginalized, right? So when we look at the full term systemic racism, it's racism that is embedded as normal practice in every level of society and leads to discrimination um, in so many different areas. And some of them include uh, criminal justice, healthcare, and education. So we'll go to the next slide. So because systemic racism is so embedded in our society, it impacts Black, Indigenous, and people of color in ways such as preventing access to equitable and quality education. It increases a lack of representation, often times, at many of the nonprofits and foundations we work at. Um, people of color are also more likely to be incarcerated and are less likely to be able to build generational wealth that is passed down to their families. And in fact, there was a study by the Federal Reserve that was done that showed that white Americans, despite only being 77% of the American population, hold 90% of the national wealth, while Black Americans, who are only 13% of the American population, hold a dismal 2.6% of wealth. Uh, this is actually a really great screenshot that I took from ACT TV. Um, they created a very interesting and compelling four minute video on systemic racism. I encourage all of you to watch after today's webinar. It shows how two friends, um, Jamal who is black and Kevin who is white are impacted, um, are impacted by or benefit from systemic racism and how it influences their experiences with education, employment, and even housing. Uh, it talks about the historical impact of slavery, of Jim Crow laws, and redlining, and how it prevents generational wealth for people of color, especially Black people. We can go over to the next slide. So one of the things that I really wanted to highlight for us today is that systemic racism has a major impact on our young people. Uh, the school to prison pipeline is an outcome of systemic racism. And one of the things that I've seen is that um, the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, um, they put out an interesting study and a, a slate of statistics that show that black students are three times more likely than white students to be suspended for the same infractions. Um, and it gets even worse when you start to think about our babies, right? So um, they put out statistics around preschoolers. Um, you're seeing suspension rates in preschool um, where while black children only make up 18% of preschoolers in America, um, they disproportionately make up 50% of student suspensions. This is pre-K. So we're talking about our babies who are like three already being shown that like, their behavior in comparison to their white peers would be judged more harshly. Um, in addition, you'll see here, I have a, a great image. Um, I'm not sure, hopefully you've heard of it, but if you haven't, um, there was a ProPublica article that recently went viral um, around a young 15 year old girl. Her name is Grace and she's from Michigan. Um, it was found that Grace was sent back to juvenile detention um, because a judge ruled that not completing her schoolwork was in violation of her, pro her, of her probation. Um, Grace, who has both ADHD and a mood disorder, she really just struggled when schools had to close and go virtual due to COVID. And a lot of those in-person supports that she received for her, for her ADHD and her mood disorders, that was disrupted. Um, and one of the things you'll find um, if you get a chance to read the article or if, you, if you've already read it, um, is that you know, there was a lot of different things at play here. You know, she, although she lived in a community that was predominantly white, uh, she was, she probably would not have received the same supports as a white student in her community. Um, and there were already certain expectations of her based on her previous behavior. Um, and a lot of that was really reflected in the fact that her caseworker, when she heard um, a statement that her mother said just out of frustration, not necessarily out of truth, um, but her caseworker actually decided to um, 
say that she violated her probation because she fell asleep after meeting with her caseworker instead of going back to her schoolwork. Um, and I don't know about many of you right now, I'm completely virtual right now in this environment, but there have been times where I'm like, you know what, this is a very overwhelming day and I need to take a nap. Um, and we forget that our, our kids are human, right? And a lot of times because, um, especially our students of color, a lot of that perception is of, of them being an other. We start to perceive them, one, as older, um, we're less likely to perceive them as human. Uh, and, and one of the things about our kids is that, you know, this was a major transition for them. So for Grace, you know, she talked about how it was very overwhelming for her and she really was hoping for compassion from many of these supposed caring adults. Um, but ultimately they sent her back to juvenile detention um, where she actually <laughs> is still not receiving the level of support that she needs. Um, and there was actually an interruption in her coursework. Um, this is an example of a system that is working without her consent, working around her, within her, um, and is basically robbing her of an equitable education, her freedom. Um, that's gonna have an impact on her ability, her, her, her ability to make money, possibly employment in the future. There's so many things that happen and she's only 15. Um, so this is a really great example of that system at work. We can go over to the next slide. So one of the things that I wanted to highlight is some of the work that we're doing at communities and schools. Um, we serve 1.6 million students across the country and we're in 2,500 schools in 25 states in the District of Columbia. And one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is empowering young people to be able to share their stories in their own way. So last year, we released a project called What We Are Made Of, where we highlighted eight students from across the country to share with us five artifacts that really describe what they are made of. And they really were able to be a part of the process of developing their story. We worked with them. They were able to meet the artist um, that commissioned this. It was an artist, his name is Jason Mercier out of LA. And he created individual portraits for each of these eight students. And we were able to have conversations with them about uh, their, their journey. One of the things we wanted adults to understand is that young people are very multifaceted. And we always like to focus very much on the, the moments of like the, the tragedy, the trauma. But we wanted to talk about the experiences they had about being empowered, about being able to take control of of their own life and their own circumstances with the support of caring adults. Um, so this was a project that we did. Um, we've actually recently uh, created a, um, an app that we'll be sharing. I'll make sure. Uh, and you can also download the app. It's available on the website. I saw someone just dropped a link in the chat. Thank you. Uh, and you know, one of the other things that it's important for us to talk about when it comes to young people is how and this may be very uncomfortable, it's okay, sit with me in this uncomfortableness, is that nonprofits and foundations have a tendency to profit off of the trauma and pain of communities of color, especially young people, um, without a thought about to how to properly compensate them. This is something that we're working through at communities and schools. I think it's fair to be open here. Um, and I'm sure many of you are trying to think about um, how you're how you're working through this in your own organization um, so one of the things that we are doing is like over the last three years we have actually come together um, at all levels from the board all the way down to our interns to work through what we are calling our kind of diversity and equity inclusion initiative um, we have been able to partner with our network to create a suite of resources um, that kind of hits across the different spectrums. Um, Middle's probably, she's gonna touch on it a little bit later in her slide, but um, we've created kind of like a continuum spectrum for our organization at all levels so that people can identify where they, where they are and what they need to do to be able to move across that spectrum. Um, we actually released a suite of videos, that's what you'll see here, these screenshots of many of my colleagues um, from the national office and the network, um, many of them who were on um, the planning team and some of them who are still also on the DEI implementation team as well. And we've created these resources and we're actually developing, um, there's, there's several things that have happened. We've implemented DEI into our organizational goals. 
So it's no longer just saying, oh, DEI, because it's become a buzzword, to be quite honest. A lot of people are just throwing it out there. And I think we've seen, especially over the last couple of months, that it is possible to do that kind of performative activism. But until you actually make true organizational change, you're really not going to see a difference. So it, the directive came from the bottom and the top at the same time. So our board has challenged our organization to make DEI an imperative within our organizational goals. And we've also made sure that anyone who is an intern, an associate, a director, a VP, we're all bringing our thoughts and ideas to the table. And one of the more important things to know is that our alumni are starting to play a very critical role because one of the things that has come up is how can you serve certain communities share their stories to profit off of for fundraising and other things. And then you kind of just go about your way. But these communities, the, the, the issues that they face have not stopped. They're still going through them. And some of the things that our young people have shared is, why can't we partner together to create a talent pipeline? That's so simple. Thinking about, OK, here we are, we're focusing on K through 12, but there's no focus on, well, what do I do when I go to college? Or what do I do when I need to look for a job? And that's one of the things that the national office is looking at, thinking through how can we create a pipeline of support that actually helps to remove or completely demolish many of the barriers that our young people face as well. Um, so those are just many of the things that we're doing and um, I'm gonna hand it over to Minna. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think we could do a whole other presentation just on your stuff. <laughs> it was so compelling. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing that. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about white supremacy culture um, and there's a lot in this so you can there are going to be links and you can definitely dive deeper on your own and in the Q&A we can also dive into it. But um, I just want to sort of level set by reminding us all of the intercultural development continuum, which I showed you at the last webinar that we did, and that I believe that this is what Sarah was referring to. This idea that we need to move from a monocultural mindset to an intercultural mindset. Um, and that when we're still in a monocultural mindset, we are in either denial of differences or polarization where differences are very threatening. When we start to move towards an intercultural mindset, we um, hit minimization, where we say things like we have more in common than we have different, uh, which is a good progression, but we really want to progress to acceptance and adaptation, where we can embrace differences and talk about differences and not be threatened by them and actually enjoy them and see how um, a community or a group with a lot of differences actually serves the greater good. So in this model, um, it's important to note that we're not trying to devalue any culture, but we're trying to decenter white culture. And um, white culture, I should say, is a bit different from white supremacy culture. Um, but I'm going to focus on white supremacy culture because it is really pervasive in our society. And it's not just white people who are affected by it. Like white supremacy culture is so much in our water that often people of color um, often display those characteristics that are listed on in the blue panel that are um, sort of definitive, the defining characteristics of white supremacy culture. Um, you'll be getting like there's some links that are going to come through in the chat um, where you can read about these more in depth. I just want to focus on the first two. Um, so perfectionism is different than excellence. And the way that I often describe this is um, from um, a wonderful talk I heard from Bonnie St. John, who in the 80s was the first African American woman to win a Paralympic gold medal. And she did it in downhill skiing. Um, and she is born with one leg. And she often encourages parents to get their kids to watch the Paralympics, because that's where you see excellence without perfection. And so for me, it means taking what you've got and knocking it out of the park instead of pretzeling yourself to look good in somebody else's eyes. Um, for me, growing up in an Indian household, it's, you know, getting 98 per perfectionism is getting a 98% and being asked what happened to the 2%. Like it's, it, and so the antidote is this culture of appreciation, being able to appreciate 
what's well, what's going well and what's good and still continuing to learn from any mistakes or failures, but keeping a good sense of balance and perspective when you do that. The second one I wanna highlight is a sense of urgency because that's coming up a lot right now. Um, I think after jo George Floyd's murder, um, there are, were a lot of people who, um, particularly a lot of white people who were new to the movement, who displayed this real sense of urgency there is a sense of urgency in the movement, um, but it's also really important that we develop like realistic plans for rolling it out. Like um, from a D, for, as a DEI consultant, there are people who have been coming to me that, that have been like, you know, we wanna be able to like overcome racism in our organization by next year. That's not really realistic. Like it's gonna take a lot longer commitment than that. And your commitment is more important than your SMART goals. You know, like your long term commitment is what will allow us to build more equitable and inclusive cultures. Uh, so we can go more into this later on. Um, and I really encourage you to look at those uh, links because they talk about each of these um, characteristics in depth. I've sort of summarized their anecdotes um, on the right side with this gray box. But actually, if you look at um, the resource, it's a bit more paragraph style and gives a lot more context um, and will help deepen your understanding of both what the characteristics are and what the antidotes to these characteristics are. The other thing that we need to talk about is sort of socially acceptable and socially unacceptable forms of white supremacy. This is a, um, so we redesigned this image. It's based on the Safe House Progressive Alliance for Nonviolence um, and then was adapted by Ellen Tuzolo and Mary Julia Cooksey Cordero. Um, we sort of made it a little bit more design friendly because that's our jam here at Brevity and Wit. Um, but it's really important to understand that th we've generally got an agreement about overt white supremacy being socially unacceptable. We need to start moving that waterline down so that more of these behaviors under covert white supremacy become unacceptable. This gets tricky and it gets tricky fast. Um, so I don't want to misrepresent the amount of hard work this is gonna take to be able to do this. Some of them um, are probably pretty obvious that we might be able to do really fast through passing laws like police murdering people of color with impunity. Um, some of them are an individual basis, like not believing experiences of people of color. For me, if any white person is looking to be an ally, the first thing I tell them is um, you need to believe people of color when they tell you things and not um, invalidate their experiences. An invalidating environment has been correlated with depression, anxiety, borderline personality disorder, and a host of other psychological distress symptoms. You, there's a lot of harm that gets done just by telling people, well, I don't think it's really race. I think it's how you were dressed or your background or your gender or something else. Just in, like, validate what they know from their own experience. Um, and then some of these are things that we could address in our organizations, right? Like not, you know, tokenism, um, bootstrap theory, um, you know, fetish fetishizing people of color. And then some of them get very, very complex because some of them are political. So um, I want to say that this, this slide, not this one that we designed, but this graphic was shown at the military and um, because it include, uh, included the Trump slogan, um, there's a Republican congressman who has now launched an investigation into the hiring of that DEI firm. Um, so I don't think that that's right. I think that um, Make America Great Again is inherently, you know, a message about racism. Um, and yet it gets complicated fast. And I don't want to see, um, I, I, the reason I bring this up is because those DEI firms need allies in the organizations who are hiring them that make sure that they get their back when something like that happens. And that means that you need to be able to have that conversation in your organization as to how you're going to manage that sort of political messaging. 
and the impact that may happen from it. Um, so, sustaining momentum. Um, I'm going to let Sabina use her incredible background in behavioral psychology to talk to us about how we can continue to be allies that way. All right. Thank you, Minnell and Sarah. Uh, it's an honor to be building on um, what you have um, what you've shared with us already. So the question about sustaining momentum. Uh, actually, Minnell, can you just hold off one second before getting going through that slide? But um, the recent demonstrations have involved as many as or. <laughs> at least 26 million people nationwide in the month of uh, June alone. And participation we've seen in at least 40% of all the US counties. So this movement for, uh, against racial injustice has really had uh, momentum, um, uh, more momentum than any other uh, movement in the past. Uh, why is that? So one of the reasons is like the way how George Floyd was murdered, knee on neck, um, which has strong connotation of shackles around the neck of a slave and strong connotations of lynchings. So the vividness and the egregiousness of the way that uh, George Floyd um, was killed, um, I think it's a really strong kind of like emotional motivator for people to go out and participate in protests. Uh, another aspect is that um, this happened during a COVID-19 pandemic. So the majority of Americans were under stay-at-home orders and spent much more time watching TV and social media. So this video was actually played and watched more than 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 any and than as if this had happened uh, during regular times when people were at work. So um, the current rate and attention uh, of attention and participation should be reason for optimism. But um, now we don't think we can go to the next slide. Um, this is just one example of a poll uh, looking at the percentage of people who say racial and ethnic discrimination is a big problem. And um, while we definitely see that the um, events um, around George Floyd and the other um, uh, killings of black Americans uh, in police custody um, that, that have become to our attention um, in, in May and June have led to an increase uh, of people believing that discrimination is a big problem. Um, in late June, four weeks later, we actually start to see a drop. And this is, this is normal, uh, but what drives this drop? And then uh, I think uh, the next slide, we see that a lot of this um, drop is actually driven by um, political uh, partisanship. So um, when we look at, um, so we have the black line, which is uh, um, uh, the total US population, representing the total US population and the red line. Um, representing uh, Republicans. While well, Republicans um, became very engaged and saw uh, discrimination as a big problem um, in early June, their concern about discrimination has now dropped actually below the 2016 and 2015 uh, levels. So this is very interesting. There was, uh, 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 and, and yeah, we could do a whole talk on why, why, uh, why that happened. But the important thing is, um, that um, what's not in this chart is that 35% of Republicans say racial discrimination is not a problem. So this, what, this, what this means, what it matters is these attitudes shape our behavior and shape what we're paying attention to. And, and knowing why participation drops is very important in encouraging people to either um, keep up with changing behavior or how do we communicate so that more people get back onto, uh, uh, onto the wagon. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, I wanna talk about like uh, a few ways how we can sustain uh, behavior change uh, and get on the road uh, to a more successful um, um, uh, racial justice movement. So I'll talk a little bit about the emotional appeals and there are two sides to it. Then I'll talk about why it is so important for people to understand the why and the how of racial injustice. And then I'll talk about how we can connect all the dots. So um, with the next slide, uh, we're looking at, so this was the, what I call an emotional appeal and rightfully so. This got people, this woke people up, this got people to the streets. And what does that do? In the next slide, we see how uh, actually, I wanted to point out um, the artists who were drawing this, uh, who were drawing this mural. Um, if anybody who uses 
these beautiful murals that have been drawn also give credit to the artists who were behind this. So, um, okay, <laughs> uh, back to the um, emotional appeals. So I said there are two sides to the emotional appeals. They have great benefits. They grab our attention. They, uh, they are a wellspring of action. When there is no emotional response, we, we ch chances are we're not taking any action. So uh, even if it is like a, the slightest hit of a uh, slightest hint of an affect, of like a gut feeling um, that we can't even express, it is a it, it triggers action. So we need the emotional appeals. But the downside is they're short lived. Um, novelty wears off, uh, even though it's like how how could this wear off? Um, we do see this, it wears off, the, uh, if, especially if you're um, overusing, um, or if, if you're, you keep using the same image. If you're overusing emotional appeals, you see a numbing effect. We see this a lot with uh, organizations who just uh, keep sending you um, uh, mail with uh, pictures of starving children. You know, if you've opened that many envelopes, um, chances are you're not responding the same way to that image as you did the first time. So those are the downsides. Um, and that means like, so we see, we naturally would see a drop in, um, in activism and in activity. Um, but so we can also take advantage of the knowledge of these downsides. So as human beings were somewhat flawed um, in kind of like processing information, but we can actually trick our mind into ways to continue to stay active um, by using some of the insights from behavioral science. And um, the next slide, let's look at like uh, how we can use and harness the current momentum and look at ways um, of taking advantage of our cognitive and emotional flaws, our shortcuts and heuristics that we're using and um, to sustain behaviors. Um, so what we need is almost like a cocktail of policies, including regulation, incentives, nudges, um, that will promote, promote good habits, even when our motivation has died down. So um, with that, I think um, I wanna say a word about nudges. Uh, nudges are all kind of like things that help us, uh, the, the, the way we design choices. So it's a concept that proposes positive reinforcement and indirect suggestions as ways to influence the behavior and decision making of individuals, groups, organizations, and even societies. So um, they are in contrast with other ways to achieve compliance, um, such as education, legislation, or enforcement. So an example of a nudge is putting fruit at eye level uh, at a cafeteria um, would be a nudge. Banning all junk food would not be uh, a nudge. So nudges are part of these like broader, what we call choice architecture. And there's a great book by um, Richard uh, Fowler and Cass Sunstein uh, called Nudge. And uh, I encourage everybody to, it's a, it's a wonderful read. Um, but some of the things that we can do um, are, for instance, um, instead of com um, having to commit to making, uh, committing to 100 hours of volunteer work over a course of year, we can break it down into batches and say, I'm gonna, come, I'm gonna volunteer two hours a week, um, which all adds up to 100 hours um, per year as well. Or um, uh, donations, uh, encouraging people to make smaller donations in a subscriber um, uh, way rather than uh, large donations. Um, so uh, just, the way people still have a choice, but the information is framed in a way that makes it actually more appealing, makes it easier and, and more sustainable. Um, another way um, that we uh, can look at, at um, some of these like, um, um, like defaults, setting defaults. And a default, when I'm thinking about DEI, it's just, I'm just giving examples. There's, there's hundreds of examples that have been done in studies that, that, that work, um, but we also need to look at the context within which they will work or won't work. But um, if you, um, for instance, promotion decisions, if the default is after a given amount of years at an organization, um, this person is up for promotion unless someone objects. That is very different than someone is only up for promotion if someone nominates them. So those are simple ways that regulation can, that you can set defaults that promote the, um, the more beneficial behavior without taking choice away. Okay, 
I could talk forever about these things, but let's move on to the next slide. And what, what we want to say, what, what's really important is that um, um, these nudges are great, but they alone are not enough. Um, we, um, if we want long lasting change, systemic change, um, we need to get into our more deliberate system of thinking and acting. And that is our, like our, our slower thinking. And uh, for lasting change that resists fading and counterattacks, messaging must be processed through a route that involves our rational thinking. And, and that involves, and, and here we have an opportunity. Once we have grabbed people's attention, we can now we have now an open ear. We have opened the door to helping people actually understand why are we in the current situation? How did we get here? What processes led to this? Explaining these causes and effects through explanatory chains, uh, chains and then bringing it back, I mean, always bringing it back to systems and structures. And um, this helps avoid people filling in their own explanations. And very often that's like blaming individual choice inner city pathology and there are a lot of other phenomena that, that, that we find how people um, explain uh, bad outcomes for, um, for people of color. So once we have explained why and how we got into this current situation, we now have entry points for change. We can start to crack basically that system. And, and it also shows like how big the task is but then like with these entry points, we now can like, okay, we will tackle one at a time and it makes it more manageable. And we don't feel like this is such a huge task. It's daunting and I'm paralyzed, I can't do anything. So this why and how is so important um, uh, to, to, to peop and for people to, to see how vast the challenge is, but also to give them opportunities to see where they and their organization can actually start and where it fits within the larger system. So um, with that, I think um, actually, not that we need more quotes by white males who have a lineage of educational success, but uh, I really like this. And for some people who respond well to these quotes, we're giving you a quote here by uh, Frank Oppenheimer, um, who said, I think a lot of people have given up trying to comprehend things. And when they give up with the physical world, they give up with the social and political world as well. If we give up trying to understand things, I think we'll all be sunk. And this came out of like a, an effort to explain environmental problems and climate change. And the same thing is true and can be applied to any kind of social, any social issue um, that, we, uh, that we're dealing with. And, um, and that is the important thing. So now, um, a lot of people uh, are participating here who work on many, many social, environmental health issues that are part of their mission of their organization. So right now, racial injustice has, um, has our attention, but climate change isn't going away. Um, COVID is here to stay for a while. And the economy is entering a recession. So how can you keep all of these on your, uh, on your radar at the same time. Um, and you can do that, not only do we need to connect the dots within each system, but connecting dots across systems. I could talk at length about how racial injustice and, uh, and, and public health and disparities in health are related, how climate change is a, a racial justice issue, how our economic recession is going to impact people of color uh, much more um, because of their starting point and because of the way the economy is currently going. So there are connectors. And if we connect the issues, it actually remains easier to keep all of them on top of our mind at the same time without getting overwhelmed because it's not one issue in one silo, another issue in another silo. And that's really important for communication. And it gets back to the systems approach. And I want to show this. Um, uh, it's actually as a phenomenon it's called, in psychology, it's called we have a finite pool of worry. We can only worry about so many things at a given time. And uh, here we have the economy, we have climate change, we have terrorism, and um, we need to talk to the illustrator to update this um, uh, with racial justice and with COVID. But what this says, if we are connecting the dots, we're actually able to, uh, to in increase our pool 
uh, of worries that we can that we can consider because they're all connected. So we're leaving a mark in multiple places uh, of our brain. And let me close with the next slide. So um, while it may sound emotional appeals are only good at the beginning and then they are bad because we don't want to overwhelm people with them and we need to get into this like rational uh, system to thinking. In reality, we actually we need both and we need to they need to complement each other. we we'll start with an ocean of emotional appeal. We get the attention. We have an open door to trying to explain the why and the how and get system understanding. But we then need to infuse some emotional appeals because people get bored and it gets overwhelming. It gets hard to understand the system and the history. And you mean, I need to go back to 1619 to understand how this all happens. We need to allow people to zoom in and show like, how, why does this matter to me? How am I involved in this? What role did I play? And then connecting, zooming out and connecting those dots again. And then you know, bringing in emotional appeals again and, and in order to put it all together. And this, this imagery is actually deceiving because it will never all be put together. New stereotypes will arise, well, new biases will arise, and we need, to, we need to become aware of them. And this is basically a rinse and repeat um, process that we need to do. And it is possible if we keep a vision in mind. And I think we have made really wonderful headway and we should not be overwhelmed by this. The, the gains for all are too great to not engage in this work. And we have the tools from behavioral science and many other areas that can help us get there. With that, I'll hand it back to Minel. Thank you, Sabina. Um, actually, I'm gonna throw it to Sean to start asking questions. Um, I just wanted to give a little, little bit of a plug that um, if you're interested in a keynote for your leadership or for your organization, um, Brevity and Wit is happy to provide that. And we're actually offering a discount through the end of 2020. And we'll do a customized virtual keynote for your organization. Um, so contact us through the website or you can contact me. Um, but Sean, do you want to get people asking questions? I do, and I just plus one to this. We need to have more of these kinds of conversations. So I'm grateful for everybody for sticking with us. We have about 12 minutes. Uh, I should first ask permission. So Sabine and Manal and Sarah, can we go a little over time, like five minutes or so if we need to? I'm getting some thumbs up. I'm going to yeah. take that as a yes. Okay. So uh, first question uh, comes in uh, anonymously. Gang, if you don't mind, let's try to use our names, but, but for this one, let's go ahead. Uh, and they, they write, uh, we recently changed our style guide to uppercase the B in black. We know it is important and long overdue, but earlier today, the Washington Post just announced they are now going to capitalize the W in white. What would you recommend saying to your leadership team if they now want to follow uh, suit and think that white should be represented with the capital W? That seems counter to the conversation we're having on this call. Some reactions. Well, I'll just say that, Sue, so, um, I think I mentioned the last time that Janetta Betch Cole is my mentor. She was the first African-American woman president of Spelman College. We're working on a book together. And she taught me that we capitalize black and we capitalize white when they're referring to races. So whatever Dr. Cole said, she is the one person who can tell me what to do. And so if she says that, then I do it. <laughs> All right, not to counter Dr. Cole, because I don't want to get sideways with her either, but <laughs> our friend Barb put something in here in response to this question. Y'all can do that. Uh, so vote for questions as well, if you would. But Barb says, um, this is from the AP, she's quoting, but capitalizing the term W as is done by white supremacists risks subtly conveying legitimacy to such beliefs. And she put in a link. So if y'all want to explore that a little bit more there, I, I think this is a place where there's room for lots of different uh, interpretations. Does that sound right? That sounds right. I mean, the, the Washington Post um, decided um, to capitalize it. Uh, um, the New York Times decided um, against capitalizing and continues to use lowercase uh, because with the argument that um, white does not constitute a unified culture. And so I just put this out there. I, but I thought like, but black. They're just black. So either. <laughs> So it, it was a really, and, and it is a very interesting debate. Um, and I find almost more interesting than the debate about whether, con, well, I don't know, the, the debate that is going on about uh, removing Confederate um, soldier names um, and so-called Confederate hero names from, um, from their pedestals. Um, I don't think there's one simple answer. 
<laughs> Sarah, did you want to add something? Yeah, you know, for us, we've actually had this conversation within our organization around this. Uh, we found when we went back, we were already capitalizing um, words like white, lat Latino, Latinx. Um, we were already capitalizing other races except black. So for us, we just went ahead internally and made the decision to capitalize um, the B in black and really just to think through like anytime we're referring to to any of those as a race in relation to people, we just are going to go ahead and capitalize it. Let's jump into the next question. Another anonymous person asks, curious to hear, we've been exploring the white supremacy culture issues at work recently, and I'm wondering with the rise in the highly visible alt-right Nazi movement, are you finding resistance to the term? Oh, wait a minute, just moved on. Sorry, gang. Uh, wonder if those same have. Are you finding resistance to the term white supremacy culture? I wonder if those same progressive leaders who will react defensively to being accused of racism would respond better to something like white dominant culture, or is trying to change language playing into the white supremacy patriarchal culture? So, white supremacy culture versus white dominant culture. Is there? A, Explain the distinction and, and the difference if, if there is one there. Um, I, so I, I, I was on a keynote where I heard somebody said white primacy, not white dominance. So there is some language going on. Uh, I, to be honest, I have not found that much restriction, like resistance to the use of the term white supremacy culture. Um, I think where it gets murky is that I don't think we've done actually a good job of defining whiteness or white culture. And so we jump to white supremacy culture and I think that's where it gets a little bit tricky. And actually I wrote a blog post where somebody asked me to define whiteness first and I had to go search, like there was not a lot, you know? And really in my mind, it comes down to physical characteristics. It comes down to skin and hair texture and you know, your nose and you're like, um, you sort of like Caucasian features. I think that's why certain minorities might get um, an easier time if they have like white presenting features, you know? Um, and so that, and then I think there is white cultural norms, you know? Um, and I think that then there's white supremacy culture, which is something different, you know? Like, and I think we haven't done a good job of teasing all of those things apart yet. Sabina, Sarah, do you want to add to this? I mean, this is so interesting. This came up at our organization. We've been having ongoing um, DEI trainings. And one of the things that our facilitators addressed right up front is when we're referring to, um, you know, white supremacy versus white supremacy culture, we're not talking about, like, in this moment, we, you know, they really break down the two because I just think it, as soon as you say anything white supremacy, white supremacist, everybody gets uncomfortable and just kind of, you know, and they kind of, you know, I think in this instance, they were able to kind of feel that. And they said, look, let's really break this down. Like we're not here, we're not talking specifically right now about like KKK and all these other things. What we're talking about is the culture that has essentially allowed itself certain norms that have been kind of designated by white people and that is kind of what's running and we don't sometimes we're not even aware of it so many of the things like Menel talked about we broke down the sense of perfectionism i mean how many times at our nonprofits or our jobs have we talked about being on time that's a cultural thing when you go like so my family's from ghana being 10 minutes late is not a problem <laughs> It's yeah. not, it's just not. But in here, because we're operating in that kind of culture, being late is a mark against you. You know, there are so many other acts, aspects, like there's just this sense of needing to be on all the time. A lot of that is, is a part of white supremacist culture. We may not necessarily be aware of it, but those are the examples. So moving away more from like the people and more about the system and the things that are operating within that. 
you know, I think the only thing I would add to that, um, I mean, people, you know, re responds to labels, but if you, once you explain what you mean by the label, and I think the, the slides with overt and covert white supremacy is eye opening. I think then everybody would have to admit, uh, every white person will have to admit, yes, the, I, 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 I have aspects of this. So I think what we can do rather than like, you, like making these words, like turn these words into accusations or, um, um, always explaining what we mean by them and hoping that and I think it will open people up to them um, and to the idea. But um, it's the only thing I have to add to that. Yeah, and I would, I, for whatever it's worth, and I'm certainly not the expert here, but as the, the one white guy on the panel, I will say this, if you are white and you find these words a little troubling, I would challenge you, this is the time to be present and maybe open up your ears and just do a little bit of listening. Does this comfort maybe the toll that you have to pay right now? It's a toll worth paying, it just is. And so you could probably see this anecdotally in some of the culture that you consume. Um, best example jumps to mind as we were all talking about this was the Star Wars movies. I'm of an age where the original Star Wars trilogy was a whole bunch of white people battling people in space. And uh, the Star Wars that my daughters are being raised on is a mu much more multicultural, more gender uh, nuanced approach to the storytelling. And it's richer and better in my opinion. Frankly, the special effects are better too. But suffice to say, we're all on a journey and it's certainly gonna be sort of that old line y'all hear is God loves diversity. Right, he loves variety. We know that because just look outside. That's what the ecosystem looks like. It's rich and it's diverse in every way. All right, let's get back to the questions. Uh, Andre, our friend out in Atlanta asks, how do we, and Sabina, maybe this starts with you, how do we balance the overuse of emotional appeal with the need to build shared values in order to sustain momentum? Okay, um, so I, yeah, I, I wouldn't think that they are in, conflict, um, the, uh, the use of um, emotional appeals and building shared value. I would say they are two pieces from the, from, 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 from the same toolbox. Um, and I'm, uh, so the overuse, I think the overuse is, yeah, if we can avoid it, um, um, that is, um, I think that would be number one, or use, uh, use emotional appeals deliberately. And uh, I also think, um, uh, you can, instead of overuse, uh, work with artists who can actually offer new interpretations of the same issues and, um, and we're giving artists um, a voice and uh, we're getting people engaged, uh, basically keep keeping the issue fresh and engaging. So that would be, that would be like, so we don't have to stop using emotional um, imagery but uh, varying it uh, and artist uh, renderings can be wonderfully helpful. Uh, building shared values. So I think it is, um, and if I understand the question for, uh, correctly, um, values, um, there are a lot of shared values across diverse sets of people. Um, uh, most people in this country love the value, embrace the value of ingenuity and innovation. That's what this country is built on. And um, while it's sometimes hard to, you know, like just say, oh, this is one shared value, so I'll immediately connect um, with you over that value. Um, talk, listening to people for a little while and understanding what their values are and uh, finding a way to align what you're communicating with their values may take a little time and you can't be just super reactive, but learning about people's values, but then bringing it back to, to overarching values um, that's, um, um, that carry through, that are not, that are not just uh, temporary. Um, so I think values usually have lasting um, presence and the emotional responses have um, a shorter lived. So I, I would say the two can, um, can coexist together, but this might almost be like, I would need to learn more about the actual context uh, where this question has come from to maybe be more helpful um, in being able to tailor the answer more concretely. Okay, we have a number of other questions. So we're gonna try to jam these in in five minutes or sort of lightning round if we could. Maybe I'll start with the final question, which was, I think if I had this right, who was it? It was in the chat. Was it Sarah? Uh, Kim was asking if we could do this again. So we've, we've devoted an hour, now two hours to this. 
I don't think we've solved for it. Uh, Manal, I'm putting you on the spot. Sabina, Sarah, we'll talk about this offline. But yeah. I put the marker down for you, Kim. I put the marker down and I, we promise we will follow up. Yeah. All right, uh, let's get to the last couple questions. There's like eight in here. Y'all can help me by voting. So we make sure we get to the ones that are most relevant to you. Um, but why don't we start with, uh, someone says anonymously, politics has been mentioned several times during this presentation. Sabina made mention of it, talking about how Republicans have shifted uh, pretty precipitously over the last, people who self-identify as Republicans have shifted over the last month or so on racial justice questions. Um, do the speakers have a suggestion on when to and not to get involved in communications where racial equity is explained, knowing that political motivations in the United States could sever the opportunity for understanding and learning? Hang on, so you guys are typing in here, you're making my screen move. Uh, do you feel it's better to take an active measure towards racial equity while knowing it may alienate and reduce the readership? Or is there a slow and gradual method preferred to influence systemic racism? I think maybe boiling, if I was going to distill that down, I would say, do you need to try to remove politics from the equation? Or is it okay to acknowledge that these conversations may, in fact, in some instances, or at least the way they're approached, may turn people off or shut them down? Yeah, so th this is a really complex question um, that here's, here's the thing. The work of DE and I is fundamentally about bridging across difference. So if you are committed to that, then what we need to build is structures of accountability, not structural structures of ki kicking people out of the community, right? Like you got to hold that so core that even when somebody says something you disagree with, you respond with accountability, not with shame, right? At the same time, we are in a moment in time where there is growing fascism in our government. Um, and so I think organizations who are really committed to this have to do some, the leadership particularly, has to do some really deep thinking of what their values are that they're gonna stand behind no matter what even if it means that they lose re leader, uh, readership or money. However, they also then have to figure out what is the plan if they lose money to take care of their people because we know, and we saw this when COVID hit, that black and brown people are more likely to get laid off when there is a down, when an, an economic downturn. And so, you cannot be committed to racial equity at the expense of black and brown people having health insurance in the middle of a pandemic, right? So that's a really complex equation right there. Um, and one that I work, I'm, I'm working with clients through right now. Some of how you respond may also be according to your industry. And I think what you have to get really clear about is what can you do within your industry? And the best example I have of this is Doctors Without Borders, which does not take money from the US government. They do not take money from alcohol, tobacco, or weapons manufacturers in terms of donations. Um, they do all on, like individual fundraising because they wanna, they, their values are about neutrality and independence. However, they will sit across from a warlord and negotiate opening a hospital. So you got to figure out as an organization, where can you bridge differences and where are your boundaries about being able to maintain your values and stopping dehumanization? So I can, you know, like, these are the conversations you need to have with clients. I can't give you an answer in like five minutes that will answer that in a, there's no rules for, the, there's no hard and fast rules for this. Everybody has to do the deep work of figuring this out. Sabina, it makes me think, because we, we've done some work on this just in terms of how the brain oftentimes will process information. I know this is what you study. Is there a place to, to, to lead with values and then talk about aspirations and uh, shared goals? You know, and so sort of trying to take the, the politics out of it or even more importantly, focusing on solutions because we know that you sort of can do MRIs. You see the brain light up when we offer people solutions. Um, so many of us in the foundation and nonprofit world, as Sarah said, we do a really great job of identifying problems and talking about deficits, but when we start with assets, aspirations, and, and problem solving, it tends to get a little bit uh, easier to bridge divides. Is that right? 
Yes, yeah, so I would I would say absolutely yes, and it's something I think that um, definitely has, has worked in the field of climate change uh, and motivation, motivating um, uh, like people who would normally who would vote Republican and by the party book would not care about climate change, but aligning, uh, showing how act on climate change aligns with corporate values of um, innovation and uh, and and profitability and independence, um, which um, showing that it aligns with things that you believe rather than buying into a party program and letting a party program, a political party program dictate what you can and can't do. And I think the drop in um, uh, Republican support for um, uh, uh, racial and ethnic equity act, act, activities um, was largely due when when they when they noticed that uh, uh, racial justice did not fall within the party program, and and that's when uh, when that that's what's driving this uh, this drop. But by looking at it individually uh, from their um, individual moral values, when they saw the pictures of and the video of George Floyd. That hit them, um, and and it and, and and taking action or changing your attitude um, was possible. But as soon as they were reminded of the party program, and I'm generalizing, it's one one interpretation of what happened there. People dropped out. So finding that value that actually does align and assure, reassures people, you're staying on the right, you're staying on the same track. Um, this this is all. It all fits with what you want and with the, the aspirations. So I think leading like with, with those values, with those aspirations, and not blatantly leading with values, but kind of like finding ways to frame issues so that they resonate uh, with people um, and values is, is one way to do that. So I, I would agree with, with that approach, Sean. Yeah. All right. I, we have gone over time. You all have been super duper generous, 67 minutes and counting now. Can I just offer you each a closing thought and also offer our thanks on behalf of everybody who joined. And I'll get back to you about maybe doing this again. We're prevailing upon a lot of your time. But yeah, closing thoughts, uh, Manal, Sarah, and Sabina. Yeah, I'm going to let Sarah <laughs> kick it off. I know we're keeping you from a meeting, so. Um, you know, my only closing thought is, um, you know, at the end of the day, as a nonprofit or a foundation, you know, these issues, they've been going on for centuries. And one of the things that I would offer up is that don't forget what your why is. Don't forget what your mission of your organization is. Um, if, in fact, the values and the mission and what your organization believes in, if it's in service of and to help empower um, communities of color, youth of color, then you cannot avoid the systems and the issues and the barriers that those communities confront. You just can't. Um, and I think we're increasingly living in a world, and I think it, COVID has helped to kind of expose that, just completely unhinged everything. Uh, we, we can't afford to be neutral. And I think it's forcing a lot of organizations to revisit what their why is and to make sure they're clear because otherwise uh, you're not really in, in service of those communities. You're really in service of yourself. So um, I, I would encourage all of you when you go back to your nonprofits, your foundations, your organizations, really challenge your leadership to make sure they're very clear on their mission. Thank you. Sabine or Manal, whoever would like to go next. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go next. I sandwich myself between Middle and Sarah. Um, I think mine is short. It's, um, change can happen. We have evidence that change can happen. And the fact that the system that we're dealing with was designed means we can redesign it. And I'm quoting Minnell <laughs> in that, uh, who has said this in many, many keynotes. And uh, I think we have a lot of um, encouraging evidence that we can dismantle uh, stereotypes, biases, and um, it is a little bit like learning a new language. It's like moving into a new country, and it can be exciting because the outcome, I think, will be um, um, will be worth it, uh, will be worth our effort. But I also want to echo what Sarah said. This is a marathon and not a sprint. These um, the system has been put in place over centuries, and you can't dismantle it overnight. So everybody should be in it for the long run and it will be worth it. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add it. So first, when I say um, systems are designed and they can be redesigned, I'm actually paraphrasing Antoinette Carroll, who's wonderful, who, who runs the Creative Reaction Lab. Um, what I will say is that um, I echo everything Sarah and Sabina say, and also this work is really about pouring love in the cracks. Like when you see a crack, like, and I, I'm guilty of this, so I'm warning you from my own experience, please don't put a crowbar in there to, to break it open. You gotta pour love in the cracks if you really want things to change. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do. That means constantly editing out your ego. Uh, but when you do, you can move mountains with it. So, yeah. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, there is a reason why Martin Luther King told his story as a dream. Right. Uh, well, with that, let's leave it there. We may come back. We will see how persuasive I can be. <laughs> Sarah Manal and Sabina, to all three of you, thank you for the time. Sarah, I'm sorry we're making you late to the meeting. If we can all send you a collective note on something, <laughs> we will do it. Uh, be well, everybody, and we will see you again soon. For the meantime, put on your mask, stay safe, wash your hands, and we'll be back before too long. All right. Be well, everybody. Bye. Bye.